is that we as an ummah are collectively facing a crisis that is unparalleled in the history of Islam. There is no other period in our history that is equivalent to the period that we have now. And the greatest reason for that is mass communication. The reason that we are threatened now, unlike any other time, is the power that the kuffar now have in their hands to attack the Muslims in the hearts of their own homes. Everywhere we go in this world, you see all across the Muslim world, satellite dishes filling the houses of the Muslims all over the Muslim world. In the poorest of houses, you will see a satellite dish outside of that house. What that satellite dish is absorbing is the filth of the lowest people on this planet. It's pouring out, it is spewing out, day and night, filth that is polluting the minds and the hearts of our youth, of our middle age, and of our old age, day in and day out, by night and by day. Ramadan has become now a time when people watch television because the best programming quote unquote, is now given during Ramadan in the Arab world. People are watching television in Ramadan. This is, this is a calamity. Really, we have to realize what is happening to this ummah. The massive impact, the massive power, because it is power. There is a power in the ability to influence the minds of people. We have let the devil into our front rooms, into our bedrooms, and open it up and allow the devil to raise our children, to teach our women, to corrupt their hearts. Really, it's something extraordinary. We have now on the Arabian Peninsula, young men, men, young men, like gangsters from the 1950s, looking like James Dean and on Marlon Brando on the waterfront with their leather jackets and their baseball hats, like Muhammad Reef turned backward. Really, going around the Kaaba itself. And then going out once they, and many of them don't even pray. Their parents are in praying and they're out there uh, like they're uh, gangsters on the street sidewalk, right? Talking and wasting their lives away. And then meandering down to the Burger King or the Kentucky Fried Chicken just opposite the uh, King Abdulaziz bath of the Kaaba to eat junk food that nourishes their junk minds that are a result of their junk television programs. And this is what we're creating, a society of junk people. And this is not an exaggeration, and your laughing is a sign of how serious the crisis is. Because like the Arabs say, شَرُّ الْبَلِيَ يُضْحِكُ The worst of things makes people laugh. We're in a crisis, and we're all sleeping. Really, we are in a deep sleep, and we have to ask ourselves, what is it going to take? How much do we have to lose of our humanity before we wake up? What is it going to take? How many children have to be sacrificed at the altar of primetime television before we wake up to what's happening to our communities, to our families, to our children, to our masjids, to our societies? How much more? How much can you take? How much can you fill your heart? With how much pollution? If Imam Shafi'i complained about losing some of the ability of his memory because he saw something haram for even a moment and maintained his glance, how much greater that we're filling our hearts with the haram day in and day out? How much greater that we have a crisis, people. And we have to wake up to the crisis and realize the weight that this ummah has. We have a great weight that's been given upon us because we are not like other people. We are not like other people. And we do not want to be like the Jews who were given the truth and turned away from the truth. And because of it, they incurred the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah afflicted them. This is what Allah says in the Quran. We do not want to be like that. The Sa'id, the felicitous one, is the one who learns by the tribulations of others. He does not learn through his own tribulation. He learns by the tribulation of others. 
by seeing others in tribulation, it wakes him up to the reality that the only way to prevent that tribulation is to stop and turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Allah wants of us. This is what Allah is asking for us to do. It's to turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala collectively as an ummah. As an ummah, we have to turn back to Allah. We have to give up our pettiness. We have to set aside our differences. We have to wake up to the truth of this deen and we have to take it out to people because people are dying. The planet itself is dying. Our rivers are being poisoned. Our food is being poisoned. Our minds are being poisoned. We are killing ourselves. Ya ayuhan nas, innama baghyukum ala anfusikum. Your, your oppression is only harming yourselves for the sake of our children. For the sake of the future of our children. For the sake of our children, we have to change. How much selfishness can go on? I want my children to, to grow up in a world that facilitates their humanity. It doesn't destroy it and take it away from them and deprive them of their humanity. It's their birthright to become human beings. To become real people. Not to become junk people that spend their lives in trivialized malls. Buying junk goods to fill their junk lives. How much more? When are we going to wake up collectively as an ummah and respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger? Ya ayuhal ladheena amanu, astajeebu lillahi wa lirrasool idha da'akum lima yuhyeekum. When will we answer that call? When will we respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger? Just something that will bring us to life. The implication in the ayah is as long as we do not respond to Allah's call and to the messenger of Allah's call, we are dead people. Our hearts are dead. Our lives are dead. And our society is a society of death. It's a society that celebrates the death of the spirit in giving life. In giving life to the lowest pursuits of humanity. This is the death of the soul because the soul can only be brought back to life by recognizing why it was created, for what it was created, and then setting out and striving to achieve that goal, recognizing that we will have shortcomings, that we will make mistakes. That those mistakes are part of our humanity. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows those mistakes because He created us to make mistakes so that we could turn to Him and He could in turn turn to us and forgive us. And this is why we were created. We were created to respond to our ubudiyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only way that a slave feels its ubudiyah, its servanthood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is in its abject nature. It is in its subjugation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that occurs by doing wrong and then desiring the atonement, desiring to reconnect with one's true nature. And this is why we were given wudu. What a gift, the gift of wudu. What a gift, the gift of purifying ourselves. What a gift is the gift of prayer, to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a gift to be able to give munajat. In a recent article in one of these magazines, they mention the fact that more Americans are playing than ever before. Adults playing children's games. From bongo jumping to blank in their, uh, these Machines that they make to jump off mountains and all of these things. This is what they're doing with their life. With the preciousness of life. One time you have, one short life you have to do something. To do something great. To be great people. One short span. Why are they doing all of these things? They say to relieve the stress of their lives. Their empty, meaningless lives. To taste just for an instant the moment. Just to taste for one instant, to have an adrenaline rush, to feel alive. That's all they're trying to do. They're trying to feel alive because they're dead. They are dead people. And by jumping off a bridge with rubber strings and seeing a cement sidewalk heading right for it, 
suddenly he feels for one moment that he's actually alive. And he wants to repeat that experience because he wants to feel alive. But that is not the life that the human being was created for. It's not through adrenaline rushes. It's not through the rush of heroin penetrating your, your, your brain. It's not through the rush of cocaine snorted. It's not through the rush of jumping out of an airplane skydiving. It's not through the rush of being in an emergency room doing cardiac resuscitation. Those aren't the things that will make you feel alive. The only thing that will make you feel alive is to become a slave of the hayf, to become a slave of the living who never dies. And this is the challenge of the human being. And this is what we have to wake up to. We have to wake up to something. I want to ask a question here. How many people have a pen and, a, and paper here? This is part of our crises. Every hand should have, they should raise their hand. Because either you came here to learn something, or you came here out of curiosity, or you came here to be entertained, or you came here because somebody dragged you here, or you came here, like Muhammad Sharif said, to take notes for the Canadian government, or maybe for the United States government. I don't know. And maybe they have pen and paper too, because they don't go anywhere without, they always bring pen and paper and a recording machine. Right? And that's why they're ruling the world. Because they work at it. They work hard. Right? But we, we should have pen and paper. What I've noted is that the women tend to always have pen and paper. Right? Seriously. And it's not for nothing that women are taking over in the universities and in all the major fields now because the men are watching football. It's like, it's what somebody said, seriously, somebody said about the fiasco in Washington, right? And that's a very good example of, of what's part of the crisis. But really, Islam looks at, at, uh, at, at peccadillos as really it's the least of, of the problems. In fact, the Republican Party in the United States is, is really, uh, they, they're contributing more to the destruction, to the moral destruction of the United States because they serve corporate interests completely and wholeheartedly. And it is the corporation that is destroying families and communities more than any other single factor in the United States, really. And so they are, they're hypocrites, right? They're hypocrites. And they deserve people like whatever that pornographer's name is who's exposing as many of them as he can because they are hypocrites. But the point is, is that we as an ummah need to begin to revive our intellectual tradition, to think, right? To take notes, to go with, with, with benefit, not to come and just sit. These people work hard. They really work hard. And that's why they're ruling the world. And we are the ones that should be ruling the world as Muslims. And if you look out there, we look so pathetic. In fact, it's really extraordinary that they even take us seriously. But the reason they take us seriously, the reason that they take us seriously is because they know history. They study history. And they're very worried about conflagrations of Islamic revivalism. This scares them because they read. They say, look at this 19th century. Something very mysterious happened. What was that? Well, suddenly there was this mujahid that appeared in West Africa. And then at the same time, there wasn't, we can't even find any, any material correlation. Maybe they met in Mecca, but who knows? Suddenly there's a mujahid appearing in Hunan province in China. And he's saying the same things and people are responding. And suddenly there's, somebody in Sudan who's doing it too and somebody in Algeria and somebody in Libya and somebody in Turkey and it's suddenly happening all over and how does this happen? We want to understand this so they examine it they hire people they give them grants to do PhDs that end up in Langley in Virginia and other mysterious places that we're not allowed to in this open democratic society to examine what they're talking about right? This wonderful democratic society that prides itself on its openness, in fact, has the most closed and secretive uh, organizations and institutions that have been known in the history of man. Right? But they study us. They examine us. They dissect us. They analyze us. They do psychological profiles 
on people like me and Muhammad Sharif and other people that get up and speak publicly. They look at the books we read, if we buy with credit cards or check out in the library. I'm not making this up. This is, this, this is what they're doing. They have $30 billion from the Congress to do things like this. And then we don't even know what they're making on the side with all their cocaine deals. So they have a lot of money. They have money to burn. And they're very serious because they see Islam as a threat. They see Islam as a threat to their way of life. What's their way of life? When the head of the President of the United States Security retired and became the head of a professional football team's security in the United States, his quote was about that strange and dramatic shift from protecting the President of the United States to protecting uh, Troy Aiken or somebody like that. He said, there's nothing contradicting in this. I made an oath to protect the American way of life. And football is the American way of life. You see, this is really, this is what they want to give the world. Games. Roman games. The old Colosseum. Put people in front and watch them, watch them watch people get eaten alive. Christians eaten alive by lions. Now they let them watch Muslims being bombed. Smart bombs on dumb Muslims. This is what they do. Watch it on CNN. Right? This is the forum, the modern forum. Watch the Muslims get eaten alive by the, the desert storm people and then the desert fox. And, and it's amazing nobody even commented. Desert fox is, is a Nazi general named Rommel. Well, I mean, why are they calling it Operation Desert Fox when he was a, a fascist Nazi general whose primary arena, theater, they call it theater of operation, because to them it's a game. It's, it's, a, it's a cinema. It's a game. Theater of operation was North Africa. Right? The Desert Fox. Rommel. And that's what they called it. So this is what they do. And they'll entertain you until you drop dead. That's one promise. Right? They will entertain you until you drop dead. And they'll drop dead too, and it doesn't matter because they get replaced. Really, they all drop dead. All their actors and actresses and producers and directors, they all drop dead just like everybody else. 